helping organizations win one veteran at a time. This is the Greencastle Podcast. And now your host, Dan Roberts. This individuality stuff is a bunch of crap. There's a reason why. A master of innovation. The key to this growing is you. Any rational person would give up. I can't disagree with that. Make sure that we're not prisoners of our own experiences. You need a team of great people. We'll not tolerate a loser. What they need is a common vision. Welcome back, everyone. It's a pleasure to have your company here on the Greencastle podcast. I'm your host, Paul Ashley. I am a former British Naval officer, now a management consultant here at uh, Greencastle. Today, we have a fascinating interview that I had the pleasure of recording uh, recently with uh, Dr. Nathan Johnson. He's a professor at Arizona State University, and he's a leading expert in the field of sustainable and resilient energy systems. Uh, This is a great conversation, and I hope you all are able to take advantage of hearing from someone who really is at the cutting edge of future development, an industry that has real uh, relevance for us all, really. Most of us are aware that the uh, energy sector is changing as we look for more sustainable and self-sufficient sources of power, but at the same time, we appear to show uh, no sign of easing up on our constant demand for energy. And this is the kind of challenge that occupies the minds of guys like Dr. Johnson. So, thank you again for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome again back to the uh, Green Castle podcast. Uh, today, we are very privileged to uh, have the company of uh, Dr. Nathan Johnson. Um, he is a character that's at the forefront of uh, the revolution that's going on in the energy solution sector. Uh, he is an active teacher and researcher of uh, resilient energy systems, and I think everyone is, who's listening is going to get a very uh, interesting and unique insight um, into what's going on uh, in, in the energy sector. Um, he's doing some fascinating work at uh, ASU, but he also has a broad experience in private industry and uh, work with the government sectors. So uh, enough from me, uh, Dr. Johnson. I'd really uh, like to let the listeners uh, get to know you. Uh, So if we could kick off by uh, just letting you talk a little bit about your background and experience in the energy sector industry. So today I'm happy to be speaking to you you from Arizona State University, where I'm a professor at engineering and I also direct the Laboratory for Energy and Power Solutions. And part of that benefit of being in an ecosystem like ASU is that it's driven by innovation and use-inspired research that permits a combination of the basic science that you would get at a leading university with applied research and entrepreneurship so that we can create tangible outcomes and products that directly benefit humanity. And that's part of why uh, a major reason, I would say, of why I'm at Arizona State is it allows uh, my team globally to create uh, cutting-edge solutions that can then be instantiated for civilian defense and humanitarian benefit. Uh, Some of the unique background in my team and composition that we bring to the table is actually coming from our international projects. And so as we were speaking, obviously that people have perhaps listening to the podcast, if you don't have a defense background, everyone's paying a utility bill. Uh, my background actually got started for folks that don't have an electric utility bill. So how do we provide power, uh, clean cooking solutions, lighting technologies to a billion to three billion people globally that do not have access to energy services? And so working in emerging markets in developing countries from small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, nonprofits, foreign governments, and then also Fortune 500 companies to provide products and solutions that are in the hands of about two to three million people globally uh, in those areas of durable goods, fast-moving consumer goods, and critical infrastructure, uh, primarily for off-grid scenarios. Now, if you take a look at that and you understand that Uh, We can uh, design and innovate from the technical or scientific perspective, having something that's a product that a person can can hold that is uh, uh, reliable, uh, low cost, obviously involves more than scientific innovation. And so one of the things that I enjoyed uh, going through my work internationally was a significant portion of business development and then studying anthropology and sociology to couple my engineering background 
uh, to create products that had uh, that are both desirable, but then also provided a sustainable business model and supply chain for scale. So having completed a variety of work in about a dozen countries in Central America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and East Asia, that um, dynamic and understanding of providing solutions for off-grid scenarios had a natural transition to the defense sector for Ford operations, noting that when we talk about off-grid power systems, generators, coupled with solar and storage, it's not just rural electrification, but forward operating bases, patrol bases, mining operations, islands, remote communities, and growing. So that work that we uh, created internationally for emerging markets, we're able to translate the defense sector. And since the fundamental behavior of electrons uh, you know, um, are the same, whether we're in Arizona or Algeria, the uh, nature of those and the science we're able to instantiate to on-grid scenarios as well as the proliferation of microgrids and distributed energy resources have grown over the past 10 years. With all that sort of uh, background and experience, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you tie in with the uh, defense industry quite a lot. Um, but on a, on a sort of personal level, um, what has been your sort of experience with uh, folks in the military uh, in terms of projects or advising or uh, you know, seeing them out on operations or at their bases? The broader military engagement has been through veteran students at Arizona State, uh, veterans in the existing workforce, uh, uniformed personnel at installations, and then also government services personnel and more recently uh, dependents. And so our work actually started uh, by working with student veterans at Arizona State and has grown to be far more encompassing. But it started about three years ago with support from the Office of Naval Research in what's known as the Neptune Program, which was to provide energy research coupled with veteran engagement and support to do a better job at articulating how the science relates to warfighter capabilities and needs. And from that early efforts of, of having um, 10 veterans on my team of 30, so about a third of the, the folks on my team with the military background, and then asking the question, well, if we're able to provide that engagement on our team to improve the work while also providing career transition support, um, we wanted to extend that benefit to even more folks. And so then we started to develop more workforce development initiatives, which allowed us to expand our operations to uh, six installations thus far, and then also existing working professionals to give them the credentialing and the capabilities where their uh, careers in the energy sector and the military uh, have partial translation to civilian sector occupations, but could benefit from uh, training and education with some of the technologies that have been out in the last five to 10 years, but the Defense Department has not yet adopted. So that was part of the work from a personal level that my team was quite passionate about, about how do we provide career transition support for veterans? And then also, how do we increase the efficacy of our projects to have better uh, impact, defense impact, and national security impact using federal and uh, taxpayer dollars? Now, once you take a look at that and look at it broader, then it started to transition to now we understand the occupations in the military. We understand the objectives set out by the Department of Navy, the Office of Secretary of Defense. How do we as a, an academic society in public institutions do a better job of aligning our missions and our work with Department of Defense objectives? And so that led into now work, yes, a little bit on Ford operations, but actually more so on uh, defense installations within the United States. But how do we keep the lights on? How do we keep the cost of electricity low? And how do we meet um, uh, needs or goals for reducing reliance on fuel and improving the resilience during grid outages? Okay, that's great. And uh, and just uh, as, as an, an offshoot, uh, do you find that uh, those that have served in the military or um, or in transitioning, do you find they're particularly uh, suited to, to your sector and, and your line of work? That's a very good question. And what I would say in, in a general way when I'm approached to this question is that folks in my team resonate on uh, a mission-driven approach or or passion in their research or passion in their work. 
Now, that passion can come from a lot of ways. It could come through service to your nation. It can come through service to society and philanthropic endeavors, uh, service in other ways. But the dynamic of the team being very passion-driven and mission-focused uh, resonates regardless if you have a veteran or a civilian background. And then the complement of the veteran uh, background with the the... Uh, four to even as much as 25 years of experience uh, for, for an individual in my team after retiring has shown the level of capability and leadership, technical skill sets, program management, troubleshooting, uh, understanding the importance of safety since we're working with high voltage power. All of that together is uh, an extremely viable resource to have walking into my team, particularly when we want to deliver on actual real working prototypes. So having folks that are electricians mates from the Navy, former aircraft mechanic from the Air Force, uh, naval nuke, for example, from the Navy, um, or even former assaultman from the Marine Corps has been extremely viable for us um, to provide tangible products. Uh, and then also the Prime Power Battalion from the Army. So these types of occupations are uniquely positioned to come in, finish their degree, and then have uh, some additional credentialing that allows them to transfer into quite uh, good wage earning jobs. That's great. And I'm sure those that uh, are serving or are transitioning are really appreciate uh, hearing that. So thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned uh, you're, you're talking about passion driving driving your team, and uh, clearly that's uh, it, that's a force multiplier in your in your sector. But I'm interested in knowing uh, in in your backgrounds, uh, primarily it's obviously mechanical engineering and uh, international development. Uh, but what sort of sparked uh, your passion uh, for the industry uh, initially? Ah, yeah, thanks. I, I enjoy that question. So I I grew up in Iowa. And uh, for anyone um, who's listening that's familiar with the Midwestern part of the states, it is uh, prone to tornadoes. And so when I was 16, I believe it was, uh, there was a series of fairly significant tornadoes uh, that went through Iowa and Minnesota. And I uh, got on a disaster recovery and a humanitarian aid um, group with the Salvation Army uh, to help rural farmers and then also some of the communities that got hit uh, to clean up, repair, etc. And at that point in time, I started to ask questions on, um, hey, this really resonates with what I want to do for my life. I don't know if I uh, want to go the route of just helping up after disaster, but can I, as an engineer, also design technologies that could prevent disasters, whether they be natural disasters, kinetic attacks, or cyber attacks, or if those attacks do occur or disasters occur, to mitigate or dampen the significant effects that it would cause on uh, human health and the economy. Uh, so I got started in that at a kind of in my as a teenager, transitioned to pursue, as you're saying, the degrees and background in mechanical engineering to have that engineering focus. Uh, transition that work broader, not just for uh, cleaner cleaner fuels uh, for internal combustion engines, but then looking globally to the 2.7 billion people that are cooking on solid fuel stoves and 5 to 10 million people that uh, die each year from indoor air pollution, how do we engineer better solutions? And with that, how do we create those sustainable businesses that I was talking about earlier? One of the interesting parts about that that got me passionate as an engineer trying to prevent uh, uh, illnesses or create a, a more advanced or growing economy is it was important to realize that technical innovation is only part of the puzzle and it might not even be a piece on the board, to be honest with you, unless we're also innovating in uh, product delivery, service, warranty, financing, the aspiration of individuals and consumer engagement and marketing, logistics questions, just because we have a good scientific idea in the lab doesn't mean it's actually going to have real impact to the globe. And so that's where I went out and studied um, uh, anthropology, economics, and sociology, and then worked with all these businesses globally to gain those skill sets, deliver on the projects for them, but then also translate that back to the academic sector to provide a more rounded experience for my team that is, yes, very passion-driven, but might also only be pursuing an individual focus within their technical studies. And so then drawing principles with business accelerators, systems engineering, and consumer engagement and prototyping allow has allowed them to get the type of experience that I had to develop somewhat ad hoc going through my own school. 
That's great. Thank you for articulating that because that's uh, truly inspiring. That that will to do something about a, a problem that you see, and I'm sure that will resonate uh, quite well with uh, with those that are serving or have been in the military. Uh, so I just want to sort of make the conversation a little bit uh, broader now and wanted to get into sort of uh, the guiding principles that uh, that dictate your work. Now, mindful of your uh, experience, uh, what would you like our listeners to know about the current state of the energy sector uh, at the moment as you see it? Good, good. I appreciate that question. And momentarily, I'll reflect on the guiding metrics of of energy and the the growth in energy systems around the world, and I'll get a bit more specific. One thing is that I often get invited to give uh, talks or conduct research on renewable energy, uh, microgrids and related systems, but uh, I, I don't necessarily advocate those out of the gates because it really depends on the on the specific circumstance and application, and the ranking priority of the metrics on. Uh, an energy system, it's first safety. You can't hurt anyone with your power. It's second is reliability. You've got to keep the lights on. Third, it's uh, economics. You've got to keep the cost low. And then lastly, it's sustainability. It's it's good to have the power green. And it's and I'm saying that in that order, and it's not to say that I'm not a renewable advocate because I absolutely am, but it's hard to justify having renewables if you know the renewables are going to hurt people or if it's going to be... Um, uh, not low cost or more. And that's not that's not the case, but often when you look from a utilities perspective, that's the ranked priority and anyone making a decision in power systems, that's a priority. And so if you took a look, look at that from a civilian perspective and translated it to a military sp- perspective, you're going to be thinking, you know, mission assurance, autonomy, flexibility, capability, which are analogous considerations, which can be enabled by renewables and other systems. So when I start to think about how those goals and the increasing threat of climate change now is more of a safety consideration, renewables start to gain importance because they are uh, now considered a requisite uh, capability or a need to allow us to mitigate the safety and health-related and economic-related issues of climate change. And so that's kind of the narrative changing, and it's often not phrased in those words, but what's happening is that uh, that's when you take a look at it as an economy, we're looking at, uh, at uh, risk mitigation, threat mitigation. And so that gets back to that safety and reliability standpoint. To speak maybe a bit more specifically, if I could, about where the, the major drivers in innovation are, there's the obvious ones which come following the decrease in solar costs, a decrease in storage costs. But more so what I'm seeing today is there is an increasing push in the, in the billions of dollars for off-grid electrification around the world. Because now that the costs have gotten low enough, what we're trying to see is how can we actually provide power to a billion people that don't have it. And they're in remote off-grid areas, and that requires a fundamentally different approach for on-grid systems. One of those issues is there's just an enormous amount of villages, and they're all different. And so how do we hasten or speed up our design practices? So that engineering design and fast, rapid financial evaluation, we're happy to be having a strategic partnership uh, with a company called Zindi out of San Diego, California, which provides a way to reduce the design time by about 80%. And then we're supporting that with some additional 10 to 15% reduction. So you can get something done in five hours rather than a hundred hours. So that engineering design innovation is very important. Secondly, once you take a look at all the solar storage microgrid generators out there, there is undoubtedly an issue with how do you coordinate those? And so that comes to the topic of control. Many of the systems installed today would be generally known as what we call legacy assets. And those legacy assets lack the sophisticated controls to integrate and coordinate with one another at high penetrations on a network. So at small penetrations of solar or storage, et cetera, they're not even a blip on the radar for utility. But what happens if 10% of the homes have solar or 30% of the businesses have storage? or 50% of the industrial customers have electric vehicle fleets. That's something that's actually going to change their load profile as well as the rate structures. And that needs one thing, which is improved controls uh, and coordination. And secondly, also needs uh, energy policy innovation. 
Because if we're talking about getting to more renewables, we're talking about enhancing resiliency, not only do we need to work on improving engineering design, also we need to work on controls, but the effect of this is going to uh, go against the typical utility electric utility business model, which is to recover costs based upon energy sales. And so now if you're generating more power locally, you're buying more power from the utility. And so then how are they recouping the costs of the transmission distribution systems and other fixed costs to get to get you that power? And there is a bunch, there is a significant amount of discussion unfolding in that regard. And we're happy to work with a few states, uh, utilities commissions, and also utilities on this topic. One of the ways that I think has been viable to consider is transitioning from uh, revenue or cost recovery through energy sales to more performance-based initiatives where you would have targets and your utility is regulated based upon an expected performance, uh, which could be you know the quality of service, it could be the amount of interconnections with distributed energy resources, it could be the reliability of the system, uh, it could be as well as the resilience uh, to, to, to mitigate the uh, changes in loads in solar. Uh, those types of metrics, I think, have the potential to facilitate uh, change within the energy industry in the United States and globally in a way that still supports utilities in changing from just electricity sales to being more of a platform entity where they need to manage a lot of different types of assets on their system and more so uh, would allow them to recover costs to maintain and then also facilitate the continued innovation and technologies that are naturally occurring. And so I think that's uh, another way of which the energy industry is evolving today. That's, uh, that's, that's really interesting. I just want to uh, dive in a bit deeper there. I'm talking about the, uh, the, the change in the, the cost metrics. And uh, obviously, you have uh, experience uh, on an international level in, in, in this sector. So we know that Western uh, European utilities uh, are losing billions in uh, market value over the last sort of, sort of a decade or so. So I was interested to know if you know of any way that the USA is approaching the uh, issue differently to uh, uh, Western Europe. Uh, are you aware of any uh, differences there? That's an excellent question. It's each country has approached the energy market or energy industry in different ways, of course. And even the United States is by no means has a universal strategy as you look at um, utilities that are regulated or not regulated, completely deregulated markets. Some states have performance based rates. Uh, some states have a standard cost recovery model based upon the amount of uh, capital equipment you own. Um, some states allow municipalities or community choice aggregation. So even in the United States, there's a massive amount of uh, differences in how we manage our, our, our energy systems and then well as the policy associated. To think a little bit about some of the, the European partners, uh, Germany obviously has gotten national or sorry, global attention in uh, promoting the adoption of distributed solar uh, photovoltaics. And that was driven uh, significantly by um, uh, what's known as a feed-in tariff. And so the, the, the energy that you uh, create uh, through solar PV is credited uh, at a certain rate. And that rate was higher than what people are actually buying power. So it made a lot of sense to put solar PV on your roof. Uh, furthermore, the industry was maturing and developing so rapidly that they were able to install, for a period of time, they were able to install solar PV on a house at about half the cost of what they could do in the United States. So not only were you had a greater financial reward in Germany for solar PV, but the cost was actually less in terms of an install. And so that created a dynamic where solar PV grew quite rapidly. There has been other nations, Denmark and others, that have done uh, not just distributed solar, but then also medium to large scale wind and then uh, combined heat and power where you generate power, but then also a byproduct is thermal uh, or heat that can provide for district heating and cooling systems uh, common for um, uh, some municipal areas, uh, campuses, and then also commercial industrial parks. Now, what's been interesting in that is when you take a look at uh, the renewables penetration as it gets high enough, we're all starting to kind of learn what are the technical and financial outcomes 
of these policy uh, incentives and different countries are learning that they might have gone you know too fast or they might not have done enough and i would say we you know definitely need to be of the mindset of doing more so we're hitting more renewables while also taking carbon out of there to mitigate climate change but furthermore uh, providing power generation locally so that each municipality each installation each country can be more self-sufficient from a, a security perspective. And in so doing, since the costs have dropped uh, uh, pr appreciably in solar and wind and storage over the past five years, that also allows us to have lower cost power relative to other forms of generation. And all of those costs are not only site specific, and, and as we uh, provide lower cost renewables, Comparing those against the financial efficacy of more conventional power power uh, power stations and plants, as you've seen, a few countries you know completely move away from coal now. Some potentially away from nuclear, though that's also more of a security concern or an environmental concern. Uh, those those types of transitions. An important thing to just briefly note. Uh, are significant, and we think about the veteran to civilian career transition. What happens about what happens to the you know fifty thousand coal miners that are now out of a job because we've made a societal shift to green energy? How do we provide them with transition uh, transitionary support and career transition support? Because we've grown an economy based on their contributions in a fairly darn hard job, and just to leave them along the side of the road, I don't believe is a, a, a justifiable or wise thing to do as society or fair to them. So how do we, from a public policy standpoint, realize the benefit that they provided to an economy and provide them with transition support to continue as individuals in a productive society and give them uh, the training and capability to, to get themselves into a new job or occupation within the energy ecosystem? Hmm. That's a really interesting uh, point you made there about uh, the retasking, retraining of, uh, of, of individuals. Um, obviously, we, we hear a lot about the future vision and uh, what's uh, coming down the line in terms of renewables versus uh, fossil fuels. Um, but uh, what, what do you think or what are your views on what are the, the critical key factors that are going to be driving the will to amend policy? Because we know we're not there yet, but it's coming down the line. And I'd also, a second part to that question is, what sort of timeline do you think we're on to make this switch? Policy is embedded within societal interests. And those interests, particularly in the last five to 10 years, have accelerated to where the majority of folks globally have uh, feel that climate change is occurring and that renewable energy should be um, not just something of, of interest, but should be potentially the primary form of energy being installed today. Now, noting that the society would also, you know, question those uh, fairly um, ambitious remarks if the power wasn't safe, reliable, affordable, as I previously mentioned. Uh, but in general, the society or the public interests is pushing for more renewables and an awareness in climate change and the potential threat that it causes. And I think it's that threat or that fear which is creating that public change. Now, what's interesting as well is if uh, you look at public policy being uh, changed, not only of society or the public's interests, there is also particular governmental organizations that are starting to put out alarm bells or interests of their own. So to speak back to a uh, defense example, um, there is a congressional report in the U.S. put out indicating that two-thirds of the military bases uh, in the United States were susceptible or threatened by climate change. And this would be from droughts, uh, wildfires, desertification, permafrost thaw in Alaska, and a few other things. So now you're thinking about tens of billions of dollars or more in infrastructure and two thirds of that could be gone uh, due to the effects of climate change. That's you know real dollars, real threats, and those are identified by governmental organizations indicating that we're not doing enough. 
And there's a lot of things that can be done. And I think we're right now getting to the point where, where we're transitioning from a, is climate change happening to a, yes, it is. And now what do we do about it? And I think that's been a very refreshing change in development in the last couple of years. Oh, interesting. And, uh, you know, mindful of the fact that we have uh, a public utility model uh, in this country, in the USA, and that they, uh, they're they operating with sort of, uh, you know, with a business model that uh, predates uh, the current situation. Do you believe that uh, utilities regard, uh, you know, microgrids and deployed energy resources as a threat or, uh, or an opportunity to their uh, to their business? Excellent question. I would say three to five years ago, it would be more often looked at as a threat because it was specifically they were specifically viewed as a reduction to revenue. Uh, they were small enough that it didn't really you know perceive to be a large threat. But as they've increased, that revenue model has uh, adjusted more so for utilities. Uh, and now, given that society's uh, growing interest, uh, state or federal mandated targets. Um, or provincial targets, depending on which country you're in, municipal level targets, pushing for renewables, pushing for microgrids, are illustrating that they're, you know, going to happen. Uh, not just from society's interest, but then from the reduction in cost relative to current available power in some locations. A transition that I'm seeing from utilities is indicating, okay, uh, there is a natural progression that direction. How do we make sure that we're not left along the side of the road using outdated policies and practices that are rapidly changing? And so that's something that I've been very uh, impressed and happy to see in the last year in Arizona. You also see that in Hawaii, California, uh, Texas, Iowa also have a large penetration of, of wind. And there's a variety of states. And then also globally, you'd have, you know, Denmark, Germany, um, India, China. I was in Inner Mongolia, and I was very impressed with the amount of wind uh, being installed there. So there's many nations around the world that are making that transition in a way that it not only personifies society's interest, but also just provides low cost renewable power. And it's the, the easiest way to do that. And so now that we're finding sustainable business models to, uh, to enable those technologies, that's getting the utilities more excited uh, from a collaborative standpoint is because they can realize where can they, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, supplement their revenue loss with some additional revenue gain by being a joint owner or operator of these systems, or potentially what's important, as well as in different types of regulatory formats, you are financially rewarded for assets in slightly different ways. So sometimes what most people on the podcast will be familiar with is you get billed by your energy use. Some customers also get billed by your capacity, and so how, how fast you use energy, it's known as demand, and so you get billed by demand. But then the utility uh, can also not just receive revenue from there, but in a broader market, they have what's known as ancillary services. And so these, this capacity through ancillary services essentially provides the stability, short-term and long-term stability, in case loads change, a power plant goes down, solar or wind change. And more specifically, that allows people to gain revenue from uh, regulation, spinning reserve, non-spinning reserve, reserve uh, replacement reserve, and then there's also a few different ways that people can gain revenue. Now, if you're able to aggregate those assets distributed or these larger scale microgrids on the 5, 10, or 20 megawatt scale, that's actually serious amounts of dollars that the utilities become interested in. So just sort of to tie up this uh, this section, um, we've talked a lot about uh, you know the change in uh, in business models, uh, the sort of timeline that we're on in terms of our move towards uh, renewables. But would you be able to sort of uh, sort of just summarize what you believe to be the sort of end state for the uh, solutions uh, sector, um, both on an individual uh, the home homeowner basis and uh, the utilities companies that are involved in the uh, industry in a sort of 10, ten year time frame. That's really good, and I do see this as a an unfolding transition. And I'm uh, would caution everyone from being combative with utilities 
and pushing the envelope on, on DRs to a point where we do see each other as competitors because the utilities aren't going away and they might reformat or change. But I think part of that change from a, a just an energy sales perspective is going to occur through becoming a platform utility where you you manage and operate the quality of power given to an end, an end service, a service entrance, whether it be residential, commercial, industrial, other words. But then you need to be able to coordinate and manage energy being uh, created or power being created from a lot of different resources, including the ones you own. And that's going to be a significant unfolding transition. So yes, we will see more distributed energy resources. We'll also see significant amount more solar and wind. Um, and then potentially, depending on locations in the world, nuclear hydro uh, being installed at a utility scale or a large scale, we'll have a uh, commercial, industrial, and military clients that, yes, are also doing solar and storage. And then in some cases, microgrids, with many of those being data centers, uh, military, or other critical operations that are happy to pay a premium uh, to, to ensure the lights are on because going down for even one second or 15 seconds can cause significant disruption or economic loss. So as that continues to unfold, and as I mentioned, the utility is gonna, it changing more, I'm curious when we're going to get to a point, and it may not be in five years, where the communications and controls are sufficiently robust where the individual folks like you and me on the podcast today and other people listening have, yes, the ability to control and understand their home uh, as the Nest thermostat has opened up for us. But what happens if we go beyond just a Nest thermostat, which is for heating and cooling, but also lighting and other systems to a smart home, but then you have a smart building and then you have a smart city? And that gets to a really good question about understanding uh, consumer or, or societal dynamics from an individual perspective, uh, perspective and then also groups of people, and how when we have electric vehicles and many other things installed out there today, how might our behaviors adapt to the availability of, of energy, the cost of energy, and the carbon associated with it? And I think that's going to be a very interesting dynamic that plays out over the next 10 to 20 years. That's right. Fascinating stuff. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to move forward and sort of drill down into uh, some of your key projects, especially what you're concerned with at the moment, uh, heading up the uh, Laboratory for Energy and Power Solutions at ASU, or, or LEAPS as it's abbreviated, because it has uh, a specific synergy with uh, Greencastle, as we're also involved in uh, project management, process improvement, and change management uh, across a number of projects in the energy sector. And uh, we actually had recent experience in helping a local energy provider uh, make a case for a microgrid technology pilot in the uh, Philadelphia region. So I think we'd be really interested to hear um, a little bit more about the, uh, the LEAPS project, uh, its foundation and creation and uh, its purpose. Absolutely. We take a, a deep approach to innovation and we provide technical and business solutions that support the global transition to a resilient low carbon economy. And every word in that phrase is quite important. And so it's not just technical, we also have the business aspects to make sure that what's the work is sustainable and can grow on its own legs. It is global in nature. It is focused on resilience because as we look over uh, natural disasters, but as a community or nation develops over 5, 10 to 20 years, the in the infrastructure, which is typically um, uh, permanent, fixed and immobile, uh, we want to make more flexible. And then we can also be low carbon or I would say carbon neutral, because in addition to providing low carbon power, there's also ways to provide carbon uh, extraction from the air that are still on the development timeline and, I th and they will be getting better over time. But that opens up a variety of different opportunities for carbon capture, combining those with hydrogen and putting uh, more uh, greener burning hydrocarbons back and just recycling that carbon back and forth in conventional forms of generation. So the specific projects within that area that my team work in are in four synergistic or interlocking cohorts. Uh, the first is off-grid solutions. And so we provided containerized microgrids, water systems, and medical units to uh, uh, several tens of thousands of people in Lebanon, Jordan, uh, some places in the Caribbean, and then also Uganda, where I have my team today. They're providing a, a, a 
turnkey medical clinic with power and water services to a refugee camp uh, for, from South Sudanese and Northern Uganda. And that's a great partnership with Medical Teams International to enable that benefit. Um, in addition to that, we do provide engineering design and consulting services to all of those communities I was mentioning earlier that don't have power. And how do we provide just a couple hours of support to get about 100 hours of impact on designing technical solutions that are sound, but then also illustrating a business model which is tenable uh, for, for low-income families around the world. So from the off-grid perspective, if I brought that back to uh, on-grid areas, so grid modernization, we've worked in energy management systems broadly that have been developed and installed in, in households and in buildings and then also into campuses. And a good question, getting back to what I said, is how do you control all of these distributed energy resources? That is undoubtedly important and more so the innovation for us is yes, not just enabling that from a technical perspective, but then how do you provide the, the security or assurance to allow those assets to participate in broader energy markets to improve their return on investment or decrease their payback so you have greater shared value to the rate payer as well as the utility. The work we're doing related to that also in critical infrastructure, this comes from a more of a national security, defense, and municipal focus, is now where might there be threats with the grid going down, whether they be uh, a cyber attack, a natural disaster, hurricane, tornado, or otherwise, or potentially a kinetic strike, uh, electric magnetic pulse, and EMP. So how do we identify where those failures may occur and what would be the result of those failures to have a better understanding of risk? So what would be the magnitude of what that failure were? And that's where most of our microgrid uh, work comes into play. And so we developed the baseline statistical analysis to uh, identify vulnerabilities and risks. We provide controls and mechanisms that reduce that level of risk. And then when the system is online uh, or grid connected, the controls we have from the grid modernization side allow those assets to do more than just provide backup power. They're able to gain additional revenue that allows our projects to have shorter payback periods in the level of five to eight years rather than 10 to 20 years. And that is of crucial importance. Lastly, what I'd say is on the workforce development side, so continuing on energy but then translating to the workforce, is these areas of work that I'm mentioning to you have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people working globally. They're going to be growing more so in microgrids or renewables. And we simply don't have enough people to do the work. And if we just focus in our team here, or even just as Arizona State with 130,000 students, we're not meeting the global demand that's required to staff people to actually meet society and, and government level objectives. So we train about 200 people per year, principal, principally U.S. military service veterans, and then we've extended that to existing workforce personnel and then active duty and several, several other groups, and we're expecting to hit 500 people this next year through a combination of hands-on training here at Arizona State, online education, engineering design, and then some extension or remote education where we're actually uh, flying out or bringing our systems to uh, different types of facilities to train people uh, outside of ASU. And I, and I hear that ASU established a sustainability school in the U.S., uh, the first one of its kind, I believe. That's correct. Yeah, Arizona State has a first school of sustainability. Uh, and coupled with that is a realization of we can't meet the demand for education and for the growth in energy or education in general if we aren't first sustainable. So to grow at 8 or 10% per year, at some point, you're really going to need to ask your hard questions about resource utilization. And so one of our strategies of growth or one of our, our enablers of growth is being sustainable. Interesting. Um, and I just wanted to jump back because uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, and fascinated by the uh, resilience uh, infrastructure work that you're doing. And I think uh, uh, this would have particular relevance to our military li listeners. Uh, you recently uh, did uh, resilience testing uh, in Hawaii for the Marine Corps. I wonder if you wouldn't mind sort of diving into that example and uh, give us some examples of the uh, work you did there. So the, the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, in uh, collaboration sharing with the, the Department of Navy, is, is realizing uh, what do we need to do for installations to be resilient to grid outages. And that's 
uh, typified as how do you maintain critical loads uh, or critical water requirements for seven days in the event of an outage or a loss of water. Uh, the Army, at least in the U.S., goes out to 14 days. So different installations will have different levels of vulnerability. And so talking about earlier, uh, looking at the infrastructure, simulating potential threats, and then analyzing where they might be weak or not. Now, the extended work supported by the Office of Secretary of Defense is to say, how do you design, how do you modify the existing infrastructure there to increase the efficacy or the autonomy in the event of a grid outage to make that seven days? And then beyond that, given that the uh, Department of Defense, you know, pays bills, just as we were saying, how do you do that in a way that it's not going to break the bank for the taxpayers? And so the, the coupled innovation of having controls and, and generators coupled with solar storage systems to have those provide the resilience out past seven days. And then when the grid is still operational, which it is the vast majority of time, how do you make sure those assets are just not sitting there being cost centers? How do they reduce the, your cost of energy or potentially increase revenue from the, the participation in energy markets? And so then we did a series of curation workshops, uh, not just from a, a basic science and applied research standpoint through the Office of Secretary of Defense, but with the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, went through a series of problem curation workshops on resilience for energy, water, food, mobility, and uh, logistics, uh, looking at where there might be um, threats or vulnerabilities in Marine Corps capability, either from an installation or a logistics side. And then those uh, problems that were curated were then circulated for, to the larger network of folks who work with U.S. Marine Corps to give them insights on how do they adapt their work in the private sector to do a better job of aligning with defense sector needs or in the uh, universities, how do they adapt or translate their science and what their work is to better meet uh, defense sector national security needs? Uh, and did th has that led to uh, to more work in that, in that uh, sector? Uh, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Army, are they uh, adopting uh, similar programs uh, to uh, increase their resilience? It has, yes. And so just with um, Arizona State and Marine Corps, we have a partnership right now with Marine Corps Installations West, uh, which covers several installations in the southwestern states. And uh, my team has about $4 million in work, and there's more projects involving uh, extended beyond that, that support installations, power, and water, and then also not just from design, but providing technology for demonstration and then training. Now, that partnership is, is expanding and broadening as the topics of energy security and resilience unfold in their importance, and then there are also their attributes. There are several different groups across the Department of Defense and private sector that do work in security and resilience. And I'd say that as a nation, we are still, and, and globally for that matter, uh, still in the early stages of how do we conceptualize resilience, how do we parameterize it, and then how do we then do work in that field. And just within the last year or two, we're getting alignment from the defense side about what does resilience mean. And then a good question is, so then what are the specific problems? And then if you design or create something, who are going to be the stakeholders that are going to kind of own, operate, and manage that? And that gets to, you know, the next stage of curiosity is just like we talked about energy policy needing to change to support utilities in the changing energy economy, a similar or analogous thing will need to happen in the defense sector through, yes, changes in the NDAA in terms of um, acts and what people are authorized to do, but more so we're finding as well as, okay, so we have a microgrid. There is no job description for a microgrid operator or manager. So then we need to create job descriptions, and then we need to hire people, and then we need to train them to do the work. And there are amazingly great capability and personnel there, but if you just looked – if you looked at a, at, a, at a power plant or a different industry and you said, we need to create an entire new industry, essentially, which not only is the technology, but the business model, the regulation evolve around it, the safety, the, the personnel, the contracting outlines and what's available, there's a significant portion of that which needs to be uh, done, originated, or translated from power work in the defense sector. 
Oh, thank you for that. That uh, sounds a hugely challenging and uh, interesting environment to be working in. So thanks for uh, uh, giving us that overview of, uh, of Leaps and, and the work it does. Uh, I want to just continue on this focus on innovation in the defense mindset, as, as you put it. Because uh, as we know, protecting, for example, uh, the grid is a, is a national security issue. And particularly as, uh, as energy becomes ever more digitalized in its controls, as you said, uh, I wonder if you just sort of summarize briefly, just so w- w- us uh, as listeners are aware, how does the increase in digital controls affect uh, the increase in vulnerability of the systems? Once we take a look at the Internet of Things and having more devices connected, they, yes, provide a bit more awareness uh, to your own systems at your house or elsewhere. They provide data and awareness for other people also to see what those systems might be doing. And we are only at the forefront of understanding uh, the vulnerability associated with those systems. And there's some very, very good people in information technology. There's also an analogous uh, group of people in the power industry called the operations technology. And so what we're starting to gain more understanding of the potential weaknesses when you take the information technology, which would be the you know USB uh, sections, the computers you have, and then connect it with the operational technology, which would be the switches and breakers and things managing the electric power grid. They, at some point, to get to the benefit of high penetration renewables and, and integrated controls, will need to interact in some way, even if it's passively. And that is starting to raise some concerns because then if you can gain a connection point in your house, would there be a way that you could actually cause power disturbances in a larger section of the network? That's part of uh, that's part of the subject with our cybersecurity work, and we look at it in three different ways. Uh, first of all is prevent. You have to stop people from getting in. Second, you have to do intrusion detection, which is being aware if they're actually there. And then lastly is mitigation, so stopping them uh, from making things worse. So the last one I would say is particularly interesting. So if you have, you know, let's just say a bunch of smart inverters or storage systems out on the electric grid and 20% of them have gotten affected, how do the other 80% then change their strategies or adapt in real time and be more resilient, to, to quote that term, uh, in counteracting these other systems that are trying to imbalance a larger system. Uh, we've also done some work right now with blockchain. We're happy to have a partner in that space to try to um, reduce the likelihood of getting infected uh, of all of these devices out there. And I'd say that there is still a significant amount more to go in the cyber and physical security because not only might you have people remotely on a computer trying to attack your systems, but you could have someone physically come up and then plug into one of your systems as well. And so understanding the breadth of what security is from a cyber perspective and a physical perspective is uh, is an ongoing or unfolding area of work. That's really interesting. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, with all these cyber threats, threats uh, diversifying and becoming more intensive, what are some of your thoughts on sort of the regulatory standards uh, that exist or should exist? Uh, because we have regulatory commissions, the, uh, the, the FERC and the NERC and so forth, but uh, do you think they're adequate? And uh, if not, uh, how do they need to change uh, to combat these threats going forward? Uh, good question. So... You know, there is, there is NERC and there is FERC. There's also the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And there is uh, IEEE, IEC internationally. There is a variety of these groups that have um, uh, partial standards based upon their organizational background and focus that are typifying or contextualizing uh, cybersecurity concerns or interests. Uh, for folks on the podcast uh, that have worked on a standards committee, and I've done this before too, it's you know a five to fifteen year effort to get a new standard that's accepted. And so as a result of that, you're going to have significant time investment of many different people to put through the language that allows an industry to be uh, regulated to a standard which is fair to all folks in the industry, and then provides a technical detail. Uh, that's and that's sufficiently accurate to describe what's actually necessary. Um, 
that given the timeline that I gave you is taking five to 15 years to go from heavy want to standard to, Hey, now everyone's using it. There is going to be a lot of changes, right? And in energy industry in general, and particularly in cybersecurity. And so the working groups or the technical working groups that are discussing these topics are going to have a busy time frame ahead of them and adapting uh, what's listed in the standard to meet a potential future, which is still unknown. And two broad categories of standards in that way that I would uh, that I would share with you is there are standards which are prescriptive and then there are standards which are descriptive. And there's other ways to categorize them now, but today's conversation is more germane to do that. So the the prescriptive standards prescribe or are very detailed on exactly what you need to hit and how you need to measure something. A descriptive standard is here's a, a direction of where we want to go. Here's the description of what the goal is. And there is more wiggle room uh, to end up meeting that end goal and standard. And given the pace of change of cybersecurity and energy, and you see this also with the microgrid standards, is they're more on the lines of being uh, descriptive. Uh, IEEE 2030.7, I believe, and then 0.8 are the two that I'm referring to, is they're giving guidelines and goals rather than specific strategies or specific prescriptive details and testing because it's too early to develop things with that level of detail because the industry is moving so fast. Interesting. That, thank you for giving that, uh, that, that insight. That's uh, fast, fascinating stuff. So I just want to try and wrap up our conversation with a quick uh, word about uh, veterans and, uh, and get your views on, uh, on sort of those people that are transitioning out of the military or are, ser- or are serving at the moment and uh, are sort of thinking about approaching uh, uh, or entering the sector. Um, with your sort of background and your broad experience and qualifications, would you be advising uh, veterans to uh, go back to school if they can think about entering the sector and, uh, and gain some qualifications? Or do you believe that uh, the on-job training that they've received in the military uh, stands them in pretty good stead as they uh, approach a prospective employer? I would advise any individual, uh, veteran or non, non-veteran in their background, is to identify the types of challenges that they want to resolve in the world, the types of problems that they want to work with, and the type of day-to-day life that they want to follow in their career. And once you've understood kind of the the larger goals and your values that then define that decision that you want to seek in your future career, then we can map out a career trajectory to provide you with a launching pad into the next 10, 20, or 30 years worth of work. And so your values over your life will generally remain remain fairly consistent, but the way that you execute on realizing those values may change, and so realizing to have the flexibility there. We might find that uh, that will allow us to calibrate or identify for that particular individual individual what amount of education is uh, requisite or recommended to reach those values. And so it could be uh, you're sufficient in your training and you need some more vocational skills. It could be community college, four-year degree, or other higher advanced, advanced degrees. And then also professional certifications such as a professional engineering exam, NERC certif- certified grid operator. And it really depends on selecting those just to best match that individual uh, individual's interest and in where they want to go with their life. When we're thinking about the energy industry, what we've been able to identify and provide is a series of about 300 hours of content, online, in person, and, and other extension based education that provides uh, credit for folks pursuing professional certifications and then can also complement their uh, undergraduate or graduate degrees. Uh, And as a result of that, we've been able to be fairly flexible on how we can provide the content we have to best map to that individual's career trajectory. So in general, if people are are interested to share and to chat uh, at Arizona State, I'm I'm always available and my team is very, very happy to chat with folks and understand out of our offerings if anything makes sense or even recommend other additional offerings for people that are our partners out uh, working in other areas. Well, I want to thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Johnson. I'm sure all the veterans uh, that are listening and those serving will really appreciate all the assistance and support that you're uh, offering. 
Uh, we're up on time here now, and I'm, I'm sad to say, but uh, I, I just want to thank you so much for uh, such a fascinating insight into uh, such a diverse and exciting environment. And I'm sure uh, everyone who's listening has, has learned a great deal, as I have myself. Uh, thanks for being so generous with your time. Um, I know that uh, you probably piqued the interest of many listeners and uh, they would love to connect with you and, and probably ask you questions. Um, would you be happy for people to do that? And, uh, and if so, how can they reach you? I would be, and thanks for that recommendation. You can contact us online. And so the, the web address or URL is leaps.asu.edu. And so the first part of that is the acronym for our Laboratory for Energy and Power Solutions. And again, that's leaps.asu.edu. And you can read a background on our work. We have all of our training projects up there. And then there is a contact us link and then a link to our office manager here. And we'll be happy to engage with folks further. But it's been wonderful being on the call today. Uh, super happy to share more about what we're doing and then have a great interactive conversation about the future of the energy industry. Thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a true pleasure to spend this time with you. Um, thanks for all your, uh, your giving us the benefit of your knowledge and your experience. And uh, I know maybe I hope we can have you back and back again on the show sometime soon. I'd love to. Thank you. Really appreciate it.